my voice a little bit and project and me, I'm sorry, I'm a girl. <laughs> um, uh, this is uh, Affairs of Arms 1 demonstration of an early 15th century judicial duel. Uh, the order of the day will be uh, First, we're going to have a paper by Mr. Gamili, and then um, he will uh, describe how the judicial duel will run, and then we will see that. Like I said, pictures are allowed. Feel free to take videos, appropriations, uh, and attributions of the video. Uh, I'm assuming the talent, but you can participate in it so they can properly mark it up. Uh, we will have, I'm going to put our second session, which is going to be at 1.30. It will be also a demonstration, although not as fancy as this one, because these guys are the good guys. In the afternoon at 1.30 in the Fetzer Center, we will have the bad and the ugly. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> we will have uh, an, uh, a fear and anybody a bizarre demonstration by Keith Nelson, and then we will have the ugly 14th century um, Hungarian horseman and other ugly people by Russ Mitchell. So uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. I hope you will find this instructional and useful and fun, because that's the important thing. Uh, so we try to have fun while doing these things. So thank you again for coming, and without further ado, Brad. <laughs> Everybody, thank you for coming. This is a little different than anything we've done here for these sessions before, so I'm going to just beg your indulgence. Um, how we're going to handle this is I'm going to present a paper, which is the part we're all used to. <laughs> we're going to hold off on any questions at the end of the paper until the end of the entire presentation. At the end of the paper, we are going to transition to the judicial duel. The judicial duel you're going to see is basically meant to give you an example of how one of these um, deeds of arms might have been fought at around the turn of the 15th century. Okay. Now, the other thing is that the first time I did a session for Anna was about 10 or 11 years ago now, and it was a very general paper because our knowledge of this material remained fairly generalized. Pay no attention to the man in the arm. You didn't see that. And imagine I'm wearing a nice sport jacket. Um, that's about what this costs. So, um, and it was a very general topic, and we've tried to get more specific, more specific, more specific. Today, the paper we're going to present is actually fairly general. Um, I'm not going to tell you about the judicial customs of one time and place, and I'll bring some of that to my conclusions, but part of that is because it is a massive topic, and one that actually, in the Anglophone world, has not been very well treated or handled, in part because Judicial duels and trials by combat were not nearly as popular in England or France as they were in the rest of Europe. And since we tend to be Franco-Anglo-centric in this part of the world, we tend to think of those models, like the famous Carouge the Greek trial by combat, as being the common way these things were done and they were extremely rare. That's not actually true. Okay? Depending on where you live, they can be surprisingly common and fought by people from all level of society and continues well into the 16th century. In some cases, even a little bit later than that. So what I'm going to do in this paper is I'm going to talk a little bit about the judicial duel versus trial by <coughs> combat, because one is a subset of the other. They are not synonymous. And I'll talk about what that is. And then I'll talk about some of the customary of these different countries, and you'll be able to see how they overlap, and then some ideas of what that might kind of show us in conclusion. Um, as I said, this is a huge topic. There's far more that can be said, more can be said about the <coughs> country. And if you want to know more about that, you'll have to come next year. Let's hope we will have a paper on that very thing. Paper because so, without further ado, let's get to it. A court of final recourse. Trial by combat. And, and as with most matters in early Renaissance Italy, the Code Duello led to a complex legal and social procedure that combined both defense of high crimes with the issues of face and personal honor, those same things that Telhoffer had referred to as wanton causes. <laughs> so, once there was a crime committed, we are told by the fencing master Achille Morozzo that the injured party needed to establish five criteria before a duel could even be considered. One, he has to have suffered a clear injury. Two, the provocation has to be difficult or impossible to prove through credible witnesses. Three, the injured has to be of equal or greater social status than the accused. Four, the cause needs to be personal, what we would today call a criminal offense. Five, 
The case has not been tried before in civilian court, even if it did not end with a verdict. That is, it was not proved. Six, the defendant has to claim the supposed injury is untrue. This is what we call the mentita, or giving the lie. If these conditions had been met, the injured party could go before a magistrate and demand that a dulista be appointed. The dulista was a jurist who was appointed to specifically investigate the necessities of the case and whether or not all the formalities had been met. The challenge would then be issued in the form of a written cartel, which was considered legally binding. As an aside, at the time we were looking at it, the office of the Dulista was informal, and often if the Lord simply appointed a respected knight who said that he believed the case had merit, they would proceed. The cartello was written in a very precise form, generally in plain language and in the first person, notarized and delivered in person or by courier, either in the presence of the Dulista or their appointee. It often would also be publicly posted in what is known as a manifesto. The Dulista would then see if either party wished to refuse the challenge. The challenger could withdraw his challenge, but for the challenge to do so, he had to be clearly disadvantaged in one of three ways. Spirit, meaning his reputation. Body, his age, health, or physical condition. Rank, a person's nobility. For example, there is no way to fight a duel against the king or emperor and maintain honor as he is one's liege lord. Once the cartello was delivered and neither side had recused, weapons, time, and place had to be determined. The defendant was given the election of arms. The issue of arms fell under three categories, offensive, defensive, and whether the duel was to be fought on horseback. This election was given to the defendant for the main reason that it would prevent strong men from abusing the institution. The weapons chosen must be equal in all ways for both parties, readily attainable and usable by both men. For example, one could not ch challenge a man with one hand to use a two-handed sword. By the same token, a wealthy man could not choose fully armored combat from horseback, knowing that his opponent could not afford to provide those arms. If these rules were violated, then the dulista or the presiding noble would choose the arms himself. Once the arms were agreed upon, each party would send an emissary to the opponent to ensure no subterfuge would take place. The duel itself would be fought. The parties, accompanied by their godfathers, who would serve as witnesses, would appear a few hours before sunset, where they would be met by a judge and a herald. The arms and armor brought out, a witness from each side would inspect them to ensure that no, no treason had taken place. The herald would read the cause of the duel and give the defendant one last chance to confess. After this, he would issue a warning to the spectators, demanding silence under penalty of death. This was done, remember that. <laughs> this was done to ensure that no sudden noise or shout would, out, would influence the outcome of the trial. Last, the herald would signal for the duel to begin. For the duel to be legitimized, the challenger must strike the first blow. This carries over into the literature of, of fencing <coughs> treatises from Italy, wherein the attacker is referred to as the agent, and the defender is referred to as the patient, which are the same terms for the accuser and the defender in the judicial duel. Now, as with everything else in Italy, what constituted victory was very carefully regulated and could be achieved in several ways, starting with the least bloody. One of them doesn't show up. The challenge confesses. The challenge is able to defend against all blows until sundown. One of the two combatants backs up and touches the list with his back. One of the two combatants is injured and can't proceed, even if he survives. One of the two combatants dies. Or both combatants die. In which case, he who dies first loses. <laughs> Did you hear that over there? <laughs> Assuming both combatants lived, the loser was now considered convicted of the crime he'd been accused of and would require uh, to face whatever punishment would normally have been meted out in a normal trial. Okay, our conclusion, and thus our transition. What was the duel? According to the Italian jurists who began to codify and record the duel code duel of the late 14th century, a duel was a contest of arms between particular individuals with an act of resentment towards one another. Most specifically, a duel is a contest of arms between two equal parties in proving or defending that which is true. It is undertaken by honor, concluded within a pre-established length of time and in a secure place. Here's what this means. Active resentment, 
is defined as an initial astonishment derived from receiving an injury and the resulting desire to repel that injury. <coughs> is akin to transferring the burden of the injury from yourself to your counterpart. This was the plaintiff's to prove, and of the defendant's to exonerate himself. What we will seek to do is to give you a demonstration of such an act. Remember the rules that we established for the duel to be fought? And consider, if you will, that we are looking at, assuming I can belt my sword and speak at the same time, <laughs> that we are looking at a camp of an English adventurer in Italy during the Italian Wars at the turn of the 15th century. And consider this case. A knight and a squire underneath that same lord. Perhaps the squire is poor and has come to Italy. He is an Italian fighting under an Englishman hoping to advance himself. An English knight far from home and the social better. Seeking fame, fortune, glory, my hat. <laughs> One day makes an accusation. And that accusation is as follows. That he did see that good English knight coming from the chambers shortly before morning mass of a well-known guildswoman and that, that guildswoman did have her hair done and her bodice unlaced. And that that knight did have blemishes upon his neck, <laughs> similar to those made in lovemaking. And that this knight is a married man whose wife is great with child. And that in having done such a thing, not only has he shamed himself, but that he has shamed the honor of his lord, Sir Geoffrey. Now, I want you to remember that, and as we proceed, remember the rules, and you'll see how some of the customs of the judicial duel work, and perhaps not entirely as you might have guessed. And so, the day prepared, their coffins brought out before them. <laughs> In the place, the quarrels and the bills of the appellant and the defendant have been posted in the court before the constable and the marshal. And when they could not prove their cause by witnesses or by any other manner, but needed to determine that their quarrel by strength, the one to prove his intent upon the other, and the other in the same manner to defend himself, the constable had power to join the battle as vicar general under God and his lord. The battle joined by the constable, he assigned them a day and a place, so that the day be not within forty days after the said battle so conjoined, unless it be by the consenting of said appellant and defendant. Then he awarded them points of arms, otherwise called weapons. Either of them would have, that is to say, longsword, spear, and dagger. The appellant and the defendant were required to find sufficient surety and pledges that each of them would come at his said day. And that this might be done, there was given unto the appellant our term and so on, to make his proof and dare. And for him to be the first within the list to quit his pledges, and of the same wise the defendant. The Lord found the field in which to fight, and the lists were made and devised by the constable. It was considered that the list should be forty paces of length and forty paces of breadth in good manner and firm, stable, and hard, and evenly made with great stones, and that it be flat, and that the lists would be strongly barred round about, and a gate in the east, and another in the west, with good and strong barriers of seven foot of height or more. The day of the battle, the Lord should be in a raised chair or a scaffold, and a place should be made for the constable and the marshal at the stair foot of the scaffold. Then would be asked the pledges of the appellant and the defendant to come, 
as prisoners into the lists before the Lord and those present in the court until the appellant and the defendant have come and made sure their oaths. The appellant came to the east gate of the list, and in such manner as he would fight, with his arms and weapons assigned to him by the court, there he should abide, till he be led in by the constable or his marshals. What man are you who has come armed to the gate of the list, and what name have you, and for what cause have you come? I, Sir David Farrell, come to prove my quarrel by the state of arms and the lists. And then, the constable should look within the visor or peer into the face of the man. And having seen that he is clearly that same man who is the appellant, then and only then shall he open the gates of the lists and make him enter with his set arms, points, victuals, and lawful necessaries upon him. And he would lead him to the Lord.